Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of What's Brewing with Mobile Cup of Joe. I'm your bearded barista, Alvy. Welcome, and we're so glad that you have decided to join us for another fantastic episode. This is going to be something special. We've been planning and preparing for this one for a while. This is our holiday buyer's guide, and trust me, you want to be a part of this. We've got a ton of stuff to go over. There's no freshly brewed news, no guests, no gimmicks, no gimmicks. First off, if you want to be a part of the conversation live, hashtag MCOJBrew, or you can also leave a comment on the event page, or on the YouTube channel, or pretty much anywhere else. If you're catching this on the podcast later, or you are uh, watching this on YouTube later, uh, not live, recorded, just go ahead and leave a comment there, or leave the hashtags, and we'll get to your, your question or comment as we get to it. But if you want to go ahead and chime in for your holiday picks for all of these categories, please go ahead and do it. Once again, that's hashtag MCOJBrew, or just leave a comment on the event page or, or uh, YouTube page or on the channel. So let's talk about what we're going over tonight. Uh, a few things exciting. We've got phones, tablets, laptops, TV and media device, wearable devices, and more. A whole bunch of stuff. We've got flagship and budget. So pretty much if you are looking for any of this stuff, we're going to take care of you tonight. Uh, so let's talk about who's taking care of whom tonight, starting from the left to right as usual for me. We're going to go ones and zeros. Chuck Haynes. Even and all, enjoying my nice uh, new Mobile Cup of Joe uh, coffee mug here, thanks to, uh, to Joe and the rest of the crew. Absolutely, absolutely. Right next to him is back from the dead, Fred. How are you, Fred? I'm doing okay. Um, UPS did not get my mug here, so I'm using a generic one, but uh, <laughs> Monday, I'm told, is, uh, is the day. Excellent, excellent. And then the host of everything, Mobile Cup of Joe. How are you, Joe? I'm doing good, but I do have my uh, mug here, uh, so hopefully uh, we'll not be uh, doing any business with UPS in the future since they screwed up Fred's order, but uh, <laughs> ready to get going with the show. Exactly. I do have my, my ugly mug here, as usual, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, uh, on my cup, uh, everything just seems to taste better in my bearded barista mobile cup of Joe mug. Uh, <laughs> but, but getting right, right along to it, we've got spec sheet Tony. Tony, I love that hat. How are you, my friend? Good, wonderful. Yeah, the hat the hat was the creation of uh, Noel M. So look her up on Google Plus. Let her know that you like the hat. Um, I know she makes them for several people, um, and she's got such a long list right now. She actually is is not planning on setting up like an ex Etsy account or anything because she has so many people just on Google Plus who are asking her to do it. So she made one for me, and you'll see later on a special little one for my baby Liam. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, last time we were together, you uh, dedicated to the show and fans. You were at the hospital about to catch a baby, still on the show, and ran out just in time to do that. So how is little spec sheet, or uh, little crib sheet doing? <laughs> <laughs> he is He is wonderful. He's the happiest little baby I think I've ever seen. Um, everything went so well. I mean, it, it just couldn't have gone better. Um, it, it, we were at the hospital, which we were, we wanted to do it at home, but uh, even being at the hospital, it couldn't have couldn't have gone better, you know, if we planned it. So it was fantastic, and he, I know, I, I think I got off the show at like nine, eleven, nine fifteen, something like that. He was born at twelve twenty a.m. on the twenty second, so he's wow. he is, was born that Saturday. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And then, as usual, me, I am your bearded barista, Alvy, and I'll be kind of moderating this thing. And we're all going to share our picks for flagship or budget, or really just kind of whatever we want to recommend here for each of these categories. So I don't want to waste any more time. Once again, hashtag MCOJBrew. That's the brew crew. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first up on my list is, for the Steaming Hot Holiday Buyer's Guide, is a flagship phone. Joe, what is your pick? For a flagship phone. Well, um, I review quite a lot of phones um here with the YouTube channel. I get stuff from, from Motorola, Verizon, AT and T, LG, Nokia, just to name a few. So I uh, get my hands through a good amount of phones that are in the market right now. Um, but for me personally, kind of one of the phones that stuck out the most to me uh, was definitely the uh, Droid Turbo on um, Verizon Wireless. So if you didn't catch uh, me and Tony and actually Aaron Traffis, uh, check him out on Google Plus if you haven't already. We did a roundtable all about the Droid Turbo because it's really um, the biggest phone Verizon has seen all year and is actually one of the biggest spec phones we've seen all year in general. 
And uh, for me, it really stuck out the most just because the sum of the parts and everything for the phone uh, works so well together. Now, in regards to just kind of the specifications, you've got top-of-the-line stuff all across the board. We're talking a 5.2-inch Quad HD display, a Snapdragon 805 processor clocked to like 2.7 gigahertz or something crazy like that, uh, 3 gigs of RAM for Tony, especially Motorola. Contact him about that and put those 3 gigs in there. A uh, 21 megapixel rear-facing camera, and a really uh, kind of rugged design that I personally really did like. Um, but just a general experience with the way the phone felt with the high quality camera, and let's not forget that massive, what is it, 3,900 milliamp hour battery, um, which may not be the absolute best and may not live up to kind of the big claims Verizon was uh, saying with 48 hours of use. Um, for power users like us, we're not going to get 48 hours of use out of it. But just to the culmination of how good that display does look, even though I'm still not totally convinced by the whole 2K fad that's going on right now, um, just how buttery smooth that phone was in the inclusion of all the fantastic Moto features, such as the uh, touchless control where you can wake your phone up from a locked state, even if the screen is off, um, being able to kind of twist at your hand a couple times to get the camera to open, the active display coming on and being able to kind of wave your hand over the screen to make it work. Um, all of it just kind of made for a really perfect package, and I'm even not a Verizon customer, customer myself, um, but I, the phone really just stuck out to me because everything worked. I really didn't have one big complaint about the phone, and it's just stock Android. Um, you've got Google Now on there. You've got pretty much a uh, Nexus-like experience when you put the Google Now launcher on there with those awesome additions Motorola threw in. So kind of think of the Moto X, the 2014 edition, both a more rugged design, a more improved camera, better battery life. Um, just for me in general, that's kind of my perfect, we're not my perfect smartphone. I'm probably one of the phones I would recommend most to people this holiday season, especially if you're on Verizon. Yes, you've got the Nexus 6 and uh, other devices like that in the Moto X, which I'm actually getting soon. I know Chuck's going to talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but the Droid Turbo is just kind of hands down one of your best choices. It's waterproof, fantastic battery life, um, insane processing speeds, beautiful display, great camera. Um, so just kind of everything added together makes it a really, really nice choice this holiday season for me. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, Chuck, go ahead. What's your pick for a uh, flagship phone? All right, my pick is this one right here. I guess I should hold it that way, and that is the Moto X second generation. Um, now, I know some people might argue that that's not flagship. It theoretically could be considered budget um, because you can get it for four ninety nine off contract. Um, for me, it is my daily driver. Um, it is pretty much the perfect phone for me. Um, camera could be better, I will say, uh, especially in low light. But for most most times, camera is awesome. I mean, and and just you know the design of this phone. The the, the I have the wooden uh, the bamboo back, uh, the white front. Uh, just the phone itself. It, it feels great in your hand. Um, it works amazing. I've had zero issues with the phone. Um, you know, normally 16 gigs isn't enough in a phone. Uh, this particular phone is only 16 gigs for me. Uh, plenty of space. Um, it's got Lollipop already. Um, even on Verizon, it had Lollipop faster than, I think, everything but the Nexus devices, perhaps. Um, and if you're lucky enough to be able to get the Moto X Pure Edition, um, you had Lollipop before most of the Nexus devices. Actually, you had Lollipop before, I think, most people have had a Nexus 6. Um, so Motorola is amazing with updates. Um, their phones just work. Uh, they add some additional features on top of it that just make it awesome. You know, specs are mid-range. It's a Snapdragon 801. It's only 2 gigs of RAM, 1080p screen. Um, and by some accounts, what would be considered a small battery at 2,300 milliamp hours, I believe. Um, but I'm a pretty heavy user of the phone and it's yet to not last me the entire day of use, um, even hitting it pretty hard. Uh, so that's definitely my recommendation. Uh, either the Pure Edition, if you can get the Pure Edition, because um, you don't get any of the carrier bloat that way, um, and you get the updates the fastest, because uh, Motorola doesn't have to go through the carriers. Or if you're on Verizon like me, uh, the Verizon Moto X still gets updates pretty quick, um, and uh, the bloat is, is minimal for a Verizon phone. Excellent. Yeah, I got to use the uh, the Moto X second generation too, but uh, I was uh, I enjoyed it. I really did. So I have to agree with you there. Uh, Fred, go ahead. What's your pick for a uh, flagship phone, bud? Hey, well, my pick um, is is the phone that um, it, it's been a little controversial here, and I'm sorry, guys, but I, I absolutely loved the LG G3. Um, now, admittedly, a couple of caveats here is that I have not handled the latest and greatest of uh, of either of the Motorola phones or 
Um, I, I guess also of Motorola, the, the Nexus 6, which I'm expecting one of next week. So, but, but based on what I've played with and handled and, and put to the test so far, I, I just absolutely loved the G3. Uh, display is phenomenal and uh, um, is just absolutely outstanding. The camera and the, the autofocus feature on the camera is tremendous. Um, the, the only thing, that, really the area in which we all parted on this was battery life and it may have been that I had a, a pre-release phone It was not set up for American networks um, so I was never on air with that phone. And without the radio on I might have been getting uh, much better results than you guys were getting on network but uh, it lasted all day even with, with heavy use and, and again it was not phone use but it was um, network use, web surfing, email, um, on screen time and uh, worked great for me. Um, and I actually like LG's um, in interface um, based on what we were seeing at the time as KitKat uh, was, uh, was, was, uh, was on it. I haven't seen what LG did with Lollipop yet, so I've got to reserve judgment on that until I do see one. Um, but um, I'm throwing my hat into the ring, and that's still my choice so far. May Fair change enough. when when the N6 gets here next week. <laughs> right, right. Fair enough. No, that's, no I'm with you, uh, Tony. What about you? What's your flagship pick for the holiday? Well, I I do I have Nexus 6 written down just because I do I want so badly. I, I'm looking forward. I'm mo I'm most likely getting one this year, and I'm looking forward to that. But as I haven't used one in more than just, um, you know, playing with one at the T-Mobile store. I guess I can't really say that as my flagship pick for the year. So I have to go with One Plus One. Um, the best, the the best, like normal uh, user, you know, mass-produced phone I, I've used so far this year is the Note 4, but um, still have to go with the One Plus One on that. Um, really enjoying it. They, I'm really, really sad that they haven't gotten the update, uh, the Lollipop update yet. Um, being being a company that is so good at getting thing at getting updates out in it well getting updates to users I shouldn't say stable updates but getting you know the next version of CyanogenMod that's how everybody always got the latest version if their company wasn't pushing the you know the update quickly uh, so being that company I kind of expected them to be on the ball with it but I understand that having an, an entire device that you have to update and keep totally stable you can't just push out any old nightly or any old buggy build. So um, that that aside, I am running CM12 on my OnePlus One and absolutely love it, and there's very, very few bugs in the build I'm running. So um, probably OnePlus One. It's It's got... Um, the best hardware for the best price is really the is really where I land on that. So OnePlus One would be my pick for this year. Looks like Alvy just oh. dropped. He so did. <laughs> let's go ahead and go on to the budget phone then. Um, so Joe, why don't you start us off with your budget pick for the year? Well, since uh, since you uh, apparently gravely offended Alvy with your uh, OnePlus remarks on that, I'll go ahead to the uh, the budget device right now for the budget phone, anyways. Um, so for me personally, I've actually got it here with me right now. Um, kind of my pick for the budget smartphone of the year would have to be the Nokia Lumia 1320. Now, this is not going to be a phone that's for everyone for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, right off the bat, you can see this is a monstrous smartphone, a six-inch display, and it's a very uh, gaudy phone and extremely big. Um, it's not too thick. It's definitely got a bit of weight to it. Um, so right off the bat, that might kind of turn some people off away from it. And the second part of it, or the second caveat kind of, is that it's running Windows Phone 8.1. So I personally really do like Windows Phone, but I know there's a lot of people out there that don't like it for good reason. Um, maybe it's the way the uh, start screen is laid out or the way that Microsoft's Windows Store is definitely not to the quality of Google's Google Play Store, Apple's App Store. And you don't have any of those Google services on there that pretty much everyone, all of us here, uh, really do rely on throughout the day. But when you're starting with a uh, starting price tag of $280, or I think 8 gigs of storage expandable with a micro SD card slot, up to 32 gigs, I believe, um, the phone it just runs really, really well. And we've seen time and time again with Windows Phone devices, even if you have uh, slower processors in there, um, maybe not top-of-the-line ones, it still runs very, very smoothly. Now, I'm not sure why this is. Now, Android, we've definitely seen throughout the years, um, as with the introdu introduction of KitKat and now Lollipop, 
Um, you don't need as high a processor specifications or as much RAM for the Android experience overall to run smoothly. But on here, even though we're talking like a 1.7 gigahertz dual core processor, and I think one gig of RAM or one and a half gigs of RAM, something like that, um, the phone still runs beautifully smooth and almost feels like a flagship smartphone. Now, you can't multitask like a boss on here or anything, but you can still play Asphalt 8 HD. Um, some graphically intense games that run surprisingly great. Um, since it is a budget phone, though, and 280 price point unlocked, you've got a 720p HD display, which actually on a 6-inch display, I was like, this is going to be terrible when I got it. I was ready to kind of cringe when I looked at it. Um, but it looks really nice, actually. Colors are still nice and vibrant. Text is easy to read. Um, I love the display size. I absolutely really my uh, soft spot in my heart for these big screen smartphones. Um, the overall feel of the phone is really nice. The back is a little slippery, um, but it just looks really striking with that a very bright orange uh, col color design right here on the back. Um, the only kind of big issue I have with it is the camera. Now, this shouldn't be anything that's really too much of a shocker when you're talking about budget smartphones. You have a 5 megapixel sensor on here. And now, for most people, uh, just Facebook, Twitter, um, Google Plus, stuff like that, or MySpace, if that's your kind of thing. Um, it's going to look fine for just uploading directly to the social media websites. Just don't expect this uh, to take pictures with this and kind of blow it up onto a big image and print it out. It's definitely not meant for that. But if you're buying a budget smartphone, um, you're really not going to be doing that in the first place. So with um, the overall in general, kind of, again, the some of the parts, we've kind of seen that uh, here as also with my Droid Turbo. The phone runs really smooth. The display size is phenomenal. It's great for playing games or streaming HD video and all that kind of fun stuff. Camera may be a little weaker, but the battery life on here, I was able to get through two full days of pretty hot, heavy use on here, which is something I really can't say all that often is especially impressive for a budget smartphone. So if you were actually lucky enough to pick this thing up on Black Friday, you were able to get it for like $99 unlocked, which is a complete steal for this phone. Um, but even at 280 for the starting price point, I'm sure we're going to see a few more deals on this thing before we actually do to get to the Christmas season. This is a fantastic phone. If you like the big uh, kind of screen size, if you maybe want to replace your tablet with it or just want to get into the big sized phone market, and you like Windows Phone or maybe want to try it out, um, this is one of the smoothest running, one of the longest running uh, phones in this price range you're going to find. Um, so that's kind of what makes it my pick for kind of the best uh, budget phone for the year. Gotcha. Yeah, a lot of lot of good stuff there. My pick for budget phone, um, I'm going to go the Nexus 5, actually, last year's flagship. Um, the camera is kind of iffy on that for some people, but other than that, you're getting last year's high stuff for much, much cheaper than pretty much anything you can find, um, especially if you go to a place like Swappa. I know Tony's a fan of Swappa, obviously. Um but yeah, if you go to a place like Swappa or really if you, a reputable source or, or even a friend that's really techie, <laughs> uh, that's what a lot of us do. We sell our one-year-old devices and then move on. Um, but yeah, you can get a Nexus 5 for next to nothing, honestly. It's it's usable on many different bands and many different uh, carriers, and it's actually still a really good phone. I know a lot of people with a Nexus 5, and they still love it. So as far as a budget device, last year's flagships are usually pretty good across the board. What about you, Chuck? What do you think? Well, you know, uh, I'm kind of going with the theme here, and I'm actually going to go with the uh, Motorola Moto G 2nd Gen. Um, now, unfortunately, you cannot get this on Verizon, so if you're a Verizon customer, sorry. Um, and you can actually only get the original Moto G on prepaid. Um, so for anyone out there for budget phones, I'm talking GSM, um, so AT&T, T-Mobile. Um, but I'm going to go with the Motorola Moto G 2nd Gen. Um, you know, if it weren't for a couple things, it probably, to me, it might be considered flagship, um, except for it doesn't have the specs that some people are looking for. Definitely a Motorola flagship. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's got pretty nice, it's got pretty decent specs. Uh, the price point is pretty nice. I believe it's, uh, was it 179 off contract unlocked? Um, so, I mean, how many $179 phones can you actually buy that are worth a darn? Um, you know, I mean, I know Fred's reviewed uh, some of the uh, HTC uh, cheaper phones uh, and, and wasn't very happy with them. Um, so there's not a lot of phones you can buy at that price point uh, that are stock Android, run extremely well, and get the battery life that the Moto G 2nd Gen does. Um, now, it's not going to be LTE, obviously. It's only uh, HSPA+. Plus. Um, but for someone who's not looking to spend a lot of money on a phone, H Plus is probably fine for them. So uh, that's where I'm going with my uh, budget phone uh, budget phone pick for this year. 
Cool. Are all of your picks going to be Motorola's, or you got some? <laughs> hey, you know what can I say? I'm a Motorola guy. You know, hey. I, I would have possibly picked the HTC M8 uh, for the flagship. Um, I, I did really, really enjoy that phone. It, it probably was a toss-up between that and the Moto X for me. Really. Uh, what about you, Tony? What do you think? What's your budget device this year? Well, well my budget device. Um... I have one that I'm really looking forward to, but I, I don't know the price of it. I know from the specs that it's a bud, that it's going to be a budget device, but I don't know the price yet. And I'm actually not sure about the embargo, so I'm not even sure I can talk about it on the air. So I will talk about its predecessor, <laughs> um, the Blue Studio 6 HD. Um, and the reason that this sticks out in my mind is because um, the budget devices that have come in the phablet size, the 6-inch um, or a little bit higher, tiny bit smaller, have been overall um, pretty big disappointments and Alvi knows this because he just uh, finished reviewing the Galaxy Mega 2 which I know he was not very impressed with but this device um, it is very but very budget it's a quad core 1.3 gigahertz uh, media tech processor 1 gig of RAM uh, 4 gigs of internal storage takes up to a 32 might be might take an a 64 SD I'm not sure and uh, 8 megapixel rear camera, which is very respectable and works really well, surprisingly. 2 megapixel front facing camera, and a 6 inch uh, 720p display, and it's currently running Android 4.4 KitKat. So it, it does have a little bit of an issue due to the 4 gigabytes of internal storage with loading it up with too many apps. You do have to constantly make sure you're moving your apps to your SD card. But other than that, at like I think it's MSRP still at 250, 249, but I think you can buy it on Amazon for about $200 right now. For $200 for a 6-inch phone is awesome. And this would be basically um, kind of the Android version of the phone Joe referred to, kind of. Cool. Excellent. Yeah, I like Blue a lot. I, I gave that to my parents, so yeah, I can support Blue. They've been on the show before too. Uh, I think back in season Back in season one. Yeah. Uh, Fred, what, what, what about you, man? What you got for a pick for the holidays for a budget device? You're muted, Fred. Fred. Fred you're muted. <laughs> He's still going. Just too excited about his pick. Fred, can you hear us? You're muted. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, uh, here we go. All right, um, I, I'm going to follow uh, Joe's footsteps here and, and go with a, a Nokia and, and Windows recommendation. This is actually an even budgetier phone. Um, doesn't look like too much on camera. It is the uh, Lumia 635, which actually Joe did, I believe, an espresso shot on right here on the show. And um, this is an extremely inexpensive phone. You can get it for about $100. I got it actually a little lower off contract. Um, it is a Windows phone. It does not have the specs of the phone Joe was just talking about, but it is a true budget phone. Um, if someone is looking for a first smartphone, I think it's, it's great. The camera is nothing to write home about. Um, display is not exceptional, but it's completely passable and completely usable. Um, sound quality of call, call quality is fine, um, and um, it's it's a, a fully functional phone in the way that a, an Android phone, as Joe was saying, of similar specs would not be. Um, my only caveat here is that, um, as was also uh, mentioned, um, if you have lived in the Google universe for um, for some period of time, you're not going to find the apps that you're looking for on Windows, and you're not going to find really acceptable replacements for them. Um, there simply is not Google+. Plus. There's not a Gmail app. You can get Gmail in the built-in mail application or in other applications. There are some clones of Google apps out there done by third-party developers. Some of them are passable. Some of them are not. Um, but you're not going to get the Google experience in the way that you will on Android or on iOS, for that matter, where, where there are perfectly good Google apps as well. Um, so that's really my recommendation. Um, the, uh, the only other thing that I'll chime in on a little bit is that I did spend some time with the... the uh, uh, going back to my uh, my friends at LG, I, I spent some time with the LG G3 Vigor, which is kind of a scaled-down 
LG G3. Um, it's not quite as budgety. I think it's about a 300 something dollar phone, uh, but I think that gets it in a little below flagship. Um, certainly not flagship specs, but um, uh, works well, and I, I enjoyed it because it looks and feels like the G3, which I liked so much. <laughs> and if I can just, but before I guess just before we move off of budget yeah. or before somebody else kicks in, um, Chuck mentioned uh, some of the other phones that I was not as happy with, in particular one HTC phone. Um, and interestingly, my, my review, my published review on the HTC Desire 510 still continues to be uh, read. I've been tracking that a little bit. And I got a comment back from somebody just about three or four days ago who said that he wished he had seen my review before he went out and, uh, and bought that phone because he ended up in just the bind that I was talking about, completely choked on storage space and not able to use it. Um, and wished he had seen it earlier. So, um, folks, um, it's my opportunity to plug myself in my reviews, but also read responsible reviews. Uh, whoever's out there listening, read or watch video reviews of people that actually spent some time with the phones, um, not just first-day reviews from uh, people that are, are just doing PR for the manufacturers. Um, read some phones of people. Read some reviews of people that have actually field tested the phones and let you know what happens after you've taken the thing out for a week or two, put some apps on it, and actually try to use it in the real world. Well, I mean, and that's a good point. And even you know, people that you trust, like I know you trust us and everything, but my first impression of the Galaxy Mega, which my review comes out uh, Monday or Tuesday, everything goes correctly. Um, but yeah, my first impressions were much higher than my review was going to be. Uh, and just because that's just the nature of, of the beast. So, yeah, Fred, I completely agree. Yes, read, uh, do, check your reviews, but don't just trust first impressions because sometimes they're de deceiving both ways. All right, so let's move on. I want to talk about tablets here. We're going to talk about flab flagship. Flagship <laughs> and budget. Oh, that's not about that. About both. This one is super easy for me. Um, flagship is the only way you should go with a tablet, and it should be a... Sony Xperia Z3 tablet compact imported straight directly into your face, and it's the best tablet. <laughs> um, there's no no reason for a budget uh, device. Go buy that one and be completely happy. It'll do everything you want it to do, except for have your babies, and that's what Tony will do for you. <laughs> so you know that, Tony, what is your pick for tablets? For All right. All right. My pick. Um, let me recover from that. Um, my pick. Uh, for flagship tablet, I haven't been. Uh, I've only been looking around the market, and I've messed around with the Nexus Nine a little bit, but uh, you know, just at, at Best Buy. But I, I don't know. I'm just not impressed. So I wasn't actually going to end up buying a tablet this year. Um, so what I ended up buying was a budget tablet. But for flagship, I'll I'll go ahead and plug the Nvidia Shield tablet. I'm really impressed with Nvidia for pushing Lollipop out so soon. I mean, we're talking uh, less than two weeks from from Lollipop dropping on the first uh, Nexus units. So that was very very impressive. And it's got the 32-bit version of the processor that's in the Nexus 9, and all the other specs are almost the same. It's an inch smaller screen, um, and it's set up for gaming. So most people who are you know looking for a gaming tablet, they're gonna want that 16.9 aspect ratio as opposed to the 4.3 that's on the Nexus 9. I went with uh, the Nvidia Shield tablet. I, I think it's a good a good device. Um, for budget tablet though, uh, I found a deal recently. It was a it was a Black Friday week deal online on Best Buy. Um, we were looking at getting my mom a tablet, so I found this Galaxy Tab Pro 8.3 or 8.4. It was only $199 on Best Buy's website, and I thought, well, this has got the Snapdragon 800, 2 gigs of RAM, 16 gigs of storage, takes up to like a 64 or 128 card. I haven't, I haven't tested a 128 in it yet. It's got the, uh, got the IR port, and overall, you know, I mean, it's, it's Samsung, so their, their build quality on tablets, at least, is, is very admirable for anything of the Tab 3 and Note uh, variant and up, so... We went ahead and grabbed her one, and she liked it so much she bought me one at that that 199 price point. So I've been using it. I actually put signage mod on it, and it's fantastic. And I find it funny this tablet actually came out in January at 399. So it's half price from what it what it was released at right now. Um, I think it's actually up to 2 229 on at Best Buy now because we're after Black Friday week. But uh, the thing I find funny about this is that you've got 
uh, a tablet, this thing has a quad HD display, and it came out in January, and nobody said boo. Nobody cared about quad HD back in January, but now that phones are getting it, now that's all the rage, and they're talking about the tablet, new tablets that have it, and all kinds of stuff. So it's I, I'm not really sure why how this passed under the radar, and nobody really mentioned the fact that this has a quad HD display, but it is an LCD, it's not an AMOLED, but I'm actually very impressed at how this Snapdragon 800 is running a quad HD display very, very well. Um, so my budget tablet would be the Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro 8.4, and it's still on sale at a very good price. I think I said 230 uh, at uh, Best Buy, so check that one out. Sweet. All right, Fred, right back to you. What's your uh, picks for tablets this year, bud? Well, I am going to. Uh, I, I guess I'm going to start a little bit of a trend here because I know where we're all going with this. Um, I um, actually picked up not not a current generation, but I guess it's at this point two generations old of an iPad, which was a little bit of a departure, being uh, a diet in the wool Android guy for about five years. Um, and mine is a couple of generations old. I think it is known as the fourth generation with Retina display. And it is, uh, it's, it's just a phenomenal device. It's, um, it is, it's solid. It's built well. The display is tremendous. Uh, battery life, we'll, we'll get a little more into um, iOS and, and, and the experience later on. But it's just, a, it's just a great device. And I do have some issues with iOS, but I am very happy with it. Um, and I think we're, we're going to hear some more on more current um, iPads. Um, so I won't uh, kind of steal the show on that. We've got we've got some more up-to-date stuff coming. Uh, but I love this one, and it's two generations old, so I can uh, only imagine that the newer generations are going to be uh, even more uh, even more beautiful. Sweet. Perfect, perfect. Joe, what about you, man? What's your uh, picks for tablets this year? Well, I'll kind of piggyback off uh, Fred with the iPad. I actually purchased the uh, iPad, my cover off here, on the iPad Air, this is the first generation model, so uh, the one that came out last year. But it's still a very, very beautiful tablet. Like, so we'll get into this a little bit more later on the show. But it weighs just a pound. I mean, the thing is incredibly thin. And iOS, I do have my qualms with it, like Fred said. We got a little segment later on the show to talk about that more specifically. But I was able to pick this thing up for $80 off the normal price. So it starts at $399 normally. I got it for $80 off at Best Buy um, about two or three weeks ago now. And uh, for that price, I kind of had to go for it. I was looking for a mobile kind of computing station anyways. And actually right now, I was looking on Best Buy's website, and they've got it uh, currently $30 off. So for $369 for 16 gigs of storage, which is what I have right here, um, this is without a doubt probably one of my favorite tablets I've ever used. It's actually my first iPad I've ever owned. But um, just the uh, premium feel of the design, the display is beautiful. Um, processing speeds, even though there's only one gig of RAM, uh, it still runs smooth, and I don't know how Apple does that. I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around how it can have one gig of RAM and run this fast, but um, we'll talk about this a lot more in depth later on the show, but if you can get a deal on this, which you are going to absolutely be able to get more deals on it, like I said, I got $80 off, Best Buy's offering $30 off right now, um, and you can bet your bottom dollar, that's a term I just used, if uh, you want to get this phone, if this tablet, um, really great choice if you're looking for one. There's going to be a lot of awesome holiday deals on it. And uh, yes, it's a generation old, but like Fred said, he's got an iPad that's two generations old. He still loves it. Yeah, it's a year old, but it still runs very smooth. The display is beautiful. Battery life is phenomenal. And uh, all, all, all in all, uh, without a doubt, best tablet I have owned in uh, quite some time. Awesome. Bottom dollar bedded. Go ahead, Chuck. What is your pick for tablet budget and, and flagship? Bud? All right. Well, you know, I had a budget, but what I'm going to tell you this. Uh, don't waste your money on a budget tablet. You're just going to be disappointed. Um, go spend the money on a good tablet. Uh, and I'm actually going to disagree um, probably with everyone except for Joe and Fred. Uh, don't waste your money on an Android tablet. I'm sorry. Um, you know, I love Android. I'm a diehard Android user on the phone. I wouldn't buy an iPhone if you paid me to buy one. Um, I have a Nexus 9. I had a Nexus 7. I had a Note 10.1. I've had just about every Android tablet that, that's been on the market. Uh, I've also had just about every iPad that's been on the market, and the iPad is the tablet to own. Um, <clears throat> it does everything better. Battery life is phenomenal. Um, I don't know why Google can't figure out battery life on a tablet, but they can't. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then the apps. Uh, unfortunately, I, I always hate to agree with Apple, um, but apps for the iPad look better 
than apps designed for Android tablets. Uh, the tablet apps just aren't there yet. Uh, so my recommendation is uh, the iPad Mini Retina second generation, not the current one. Um, so a, a generation old, which might be kind of going, you know, why why would you recommend a generation old? Uh, well, a generation old, you can save yourself, I think, about $100. Um, and the only thing that the newer generation has uh, that the old generation does not have is the Touch ID, so your your fingerprint. And let's face it, who really cares about fingerprint sensors on on a tablet? Uh, maybe you do, but if you do, not sorry. the police. That's who. <laughs> well, there you go. Exactly. So, so my recommendation is either go buy an iPad Air two, or go buy uh, an iPad Mini Retina second generation, so the generation before. Uh, I'm not even going to recommend a budget tablet. No, well, and I agree. You know, especially your comment about budget Android tablets, they're terrible, and, and it just bring, leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. There's no way to make them work. If you're going to do something like that, buy a two-year-old flagship from a couple years ago. That's exactly um, what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't buy right, budget, so just on. get an old one. <laughs> do what? Don't buy budget, just get last year's model. That's the yeah, best seriously. thing you can do. I mean, yeah. um, it's going to be about the same price, honestly, especially if you, you do some sh shopping around, you can get a good deal on them. Well, and uh, if you do any modding, for Android tablets at least, last year's yes. model is always the budget way to go because there's going to be good development and there's going to be really, really good well, ROMs that really work well. Yeah, exactly right, especially if you get on some of the more common last year's flagship tablets. Uh, you know, I have my Sony stuff, and it, the development is kind of hit and miss sometimes, so even last year's stuff is, there's two or three out, but yeah, you get a Nexus, or you get a Samsung, or a Motorola, or something like that, across the board, tablet or phone. Um, let's talk laptops for a minute, and we'll do this the same way, high-end, uh, actually, we've got three topics, so let's do high-end, portable, and budget, which portable and budget, a lot for a lot of us, is going to blend together. Um, I can make a recommendation against Chromebooks, um, just because, and that's pro probably an unpopular opinion, but I'm a power user, and I want it to do more. And if if it can't keep up and it keeps crashing, and mine does, and I've got a C710, so it's a year or two, year or two old now, um, but all my experiences with Chromebooks have been they're okay for normal people. And I know that sounds really weird and mean to say, if your niece is going into college and she needs something to type up papers, it's perfect. But if you want something with a little bit of oomph and a little power, the Chromebook just doesn't have it. Um, and you can argue with me about it doesn't print or it doesn't have native apps and all that kind of stuff. My main thing is just processing. I'll go spec sheet on it. But I can recommend against a Chromebook, and I would say get you an actual real laptop, if uh, for lack of a better word. Um, but let, let, let's just run down the line. Chuck, I'll start with you because I know you've got a lot about these uh, laptops. Go ahead. What's your picks, high-end, portable, and budget for laptops this season? Sure. And actually, Tone, uh, actually, Alvy, I'll probably agree with you. Um, I actually have a budget uh, laptop pick is the Chromebook, uh, the Acer C720P. I do like it, um, but I do agree with you. It is a budget laptop. Um, it, it is not a high-end laptop. There is no high-end Chromebook. I'm sorry, Pixel users, you can argue as much as you want. A Chromebook is not a high-end laptop. It's just not. Um, you know, and I know a lot of Pixel users right now, they're, they're sitting there going, oh, you know, we've got the high-end Pixel. I'm sorry. No, you don't. Um, so uh, Chromebooks are a budget laptop. Uh, the Acer C720P, which is what I have, is a great laptop, um, but it is for an average user. It is for someone who doesn't demand a lot of their laptop, um, they, they go online, they, they look on Facebook, you know, I'll equate Facebook users maybe to Chromebook users, I don't know, but, um, uh, you know, they, they go online, they look at Facebook, uh, they, they might, uh, you know, shop online on Amazon, but they just don't do a whole lot on their laptop. Uh, for those, budget laptop, uh, definitely the, the Chromebook. Um, for portable laptop, um, you know, I'm actually a big Mac guy, but I'm going to go a little bit outside the Mac universe here. Uh, and for the portable laptop, I'm actually going to recommend the Surface Pro 3. Um, it is an amazing device. It is a very transformable device. You've got a laptop. You've got a tablet. You've got a device you can write on with that little pen. And, and, and I'm not talking about a pen like a stylus you buy for an iPad here. Um, this is a touch-sensitive pen that can actually distinguish between how, how hard you're pressing on the screen. Um, so you can do it a lot with this device. Um, for portable devices, you know, it's, it's a little pricey, 
Um, but I am going to recommend uh, the Surface Pro 3. I think it's a phenomenal portal devi portable device. Um, I think for anyone who wants some umph out of their, their machine, who wants to basically be able to do anything that they want with that machine, tablet, laptop, anything they could possibly want, it's the Surface Pro 3. Um, I know some people out there are kind of you know, shaking their head going, oh, you're recommending a Windows device. Well, you're right, but uh, Windows was designed for this machine. Uh, when Microsoft designed Windows, they designed it for the Surface 2 and the Surface Pro 3. That was their entire uh, design behind Windows. Uh, so this is like the machine to run Windows on. Um, as far as high-end laptops, uh, I am going to recommend the 15-inch Apple Ma uh, MacBook Retina Pro, or Retina MacBook Pro, whatever it's called. Um, uh, spend the extra money if you want a great laptop, high-end device, plenty of oomph, lots of horsepower. Uh, get the quad. It's got the quad-core i7. You can get 16 gigs of RAM, a terabyte SSD. Um, it is an amazing device. It has been my daily driver for the last three years, uh, four actually four years now. Um, I've had uh, each year I've gotten uh, a new Retina MacBook Pro. Love them. Uh, the current one I have is actually uh, two generations old, and it beats about every laptop out on the market uh, right now. Um, so that's definitely my pick for high end. Uh, it's you're going to get the most bang for your buck. You're going to spend three thousand dollars on it, but it's going to last you five years. Um, so that's definitely my pick on the top end. Yeah, I agree. That's what that's what I run to on for the show and for all my video stuff. And there's just really nothing like it. Uh, Fred, what about you? What's your laptop choices for the season? Well, I I, I don't really have a a choice specifically. I didn't. Well, I I did buy a laptop. It was a Chromebook. It was also a C10. Um, I I just want to comment on this um, that you can't really compare a Chromebook to uh, a MacBook Pro. And uh, no, nobody can buy it with that expectation. Um, Chromebook is uh, a device that I, I, I did buy a C10. Um, you certainly can't use it in as a power user. Frankly, I wouldn't even re recommend using it for Facebook or anything that's going to be um, heavily graphic intensive and, and all of everybody's animated GIFs and videos rolling by on, on Facebook are going to suck up the, uh, the resources that you've got there. But if you want something with a little bigger of a screen, a little bigger of a keyboard than your phone when you're out on the go um, with a battery that's going to last you for a little while in case you have to camp out someplace, uh, um, if you're at an event writing a story, whatever the case may be, it's, it's just something that's uh, uh, a little bit more than you might get out of a, out of a phone in a situation where you, where you want a real keyboard to type on. And quite honestly, you can't be comparing it to full-blown laptops, but if you want to compare it to, um, to uh, inexpensive, ultra-portable Windows computers, it's going to be Chromebooks hands down. Um, Chromebooks will do exactly what they're supposed to do. Um, in, inexpensive Windows um, laptops are are going to be crippled in the same way as we've talked about other completely too low end of devices and there is no nothing Mac in the price range to uh, to compare it to so I, I've got to give uh, just a couple of a few words here in defense of Chromebooks now that's fair and you and you know, I said that my niece was going to college and that's exactly what she did how how old are the Chromebooks it's that first generation that Samsung Chromebook that came out is that two years or three years now Mm, I think it's going on three. Okay, I think it's going on three. But we'll I think so too. And she got that one when it first came out, that first Chromebook, that Samsung Silver one, the Series yeah. Three or the Five. Uh, so that was the one that was still the Intel, right? That wasn't the ARM processor. Who it's for and who it's marketed for? Yeah, I. Uh, you're you're right, Fred. I wasn't being fair and I was being a little harsh on it, but still know that going in, if you're trying to buy one this holiday season. Buy, buy what you need and what you're actually looking for. If you're needing a power device that can handle 16 tabs open as you do your research, as you write your papers like I do, it won't handle it. If you're trying to write, do videos and stuff, obviously it won't do that. But if you just need it to do what it does, it's perfect for it. So you're right. Tony, what about you? Chime in on this. Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess I'll end with my high-end pick because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback onto the Chromebook. I have to pretty drastically disagree with, with almost everyone but Fred, and here's why. Because, yes, while the people watching our show are most likely going to be tech, tech enthusiasts who to whom a Chromebook would be a supplemental device, not a main device, 
Um, everyone who shops for laptops at Walmart, I, in my opinion, they shouldn't sell Windows laptops at Walmart. They should just have a line of Chromebooks. Because if you're shopping it for a laptop at Walmart, all you're going to be doing on it is Facebook. All you're going to be doing on it is looking up, you know, restaurants, looking up what place close to me delivers, stuff like that. Um, and to me, everyone, if you have an internet connection in your home, you may only need a Chromebook because all the people who want to use that, because honestly, what are people doing to access their daily, you know, to, to you? compute their normal stuff daily now. It's their phones. So any of the intensive stuff, like people are editing fo editing, editing photos, guess what? Instagram. I know it's sad that that's how we're editing photos, but it is because it's so convenient and they end up looking so good, albeit very small. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's what people yeah, are doing now. Nobody is, nobody's buying a computer at, at Walmart to put Photoshop on. So if they are, they're going to Best Buy, they're researching, they're buying the MacBook Pro or the equivalent in a Windows machine. Um, so for me, my, my budget pick is the HP Chromebook 14 uh, 4G model. Now that is a year old, but uh, my work got it for me last Christmas, and I use that thing every day, every day. And it's got 4 gigs of RAM. So if you're a power user and you have a Chromebook, you cannot get by with two gigs of RAM. And that's where we have all these people who saying, you know, you guys all saying that Chromebooks don't perform as well. It's because you're using a Chromebook with two gigs of RAM. You need a Chromebook with four gigs of RAM. Then you'll see that it, it web browses exactly the way you would on a full computer. But you can't expect it to do more than web browse. Uh, so that would be my pick. But again, we're talking port budget laptops. That's still probably, I think you can get them for in the 200 range now, but when it came out, it was 350. So I don't know if you'd even call that a budget laptop. Um, for portable laptops, my pick would be the Lenovo Yoga 3. Um, that is my, my mother just brought one over. She bought one for her boss. Um, and it is awesome. I mean, you flip it around and it's a tablet. It's got the you can the, the orientation of the screen changes. Um, that was really really cool and very very portable. And for high end laptops, I can't recommend a Windows device because I haven't actually used a Surface Pro three. Um, the S System seventy six Bonobo Extreme. If you're gonna go out, go all out. <laughs> I mean, that thing's, I think it's $1,500, but it's packed with uh, the latest, I think it's the latest i7 processor, probably 16 gigs expandable up to 32 gigs of RAM, and a gigantic solid-state drive. So that would be my recommendation for high-end laptops. Uh, but yeah, in general, the laptops, they're a sticky wicket because you have to know what, you have to know exactly what you need before you start shopping because so many people they they really cut uh, shoot themselves in the foot by going up to the salesman and saying hey I need a laptop that can run Microsoft Word because they're automatically going to only offer them Windows computers and if they're not if they're not buying a thousand dollar Windows computer or something like a Surface Pro 3 that's designed to work correctly uh, they're just not going to get a device that performs well and even if it does perform well out of the box it's not going to perform well in a couple months yeah, well, I mean, and the salespeople, they're trying to just give them what they ask for. I need something that does Microsoft Word, but there's just many other options. Really, and especially with laptops, I, I get this question a lot, and I know a lot of our viewers do too. You know, what's your recommendation for stuff? And, you know, that's what, that's what we do as techie people and people that watch the show. Um, research and try to educate your friends. We've talked about this on, um, I think, our roundtable about your phone is like a bed. Be educated and... and We need a record skipping noise for every time this happens. <laughs> or LV. So the people listening on the Chromecast later don't wonder what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Be educated and 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 and. and <laughs> well, it looks like we might have lost Alvy for a little bit. So, uh, Joe, should we move on here? Let's yeah, we'll go ahead and. Uh... Oh, go ahead and do wearables. All right. Um. So I'll go ahead and kick that off really quick. Um. And I'll oh, let you guys get. Oh, media it. devices. Sorry about that. <laughs> What do we skip? Media, oh, media devices. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, There's only a couple we'll go, of those. We'll go media devices real quick, real quick and go through those. Um, so for me personally, I have got the Roku 3, the Google Chromecast, and the Amazon Fire TV. So um, I kind of mess, get my uh, foot in the door with a lot of these uh, media streaming devices. And the Chromecast, I love it for its price point, $35. Uh, you really can't beat it. 
Fire TV I love because you've got the gaming inclusion with there, uh, with the game selection available for it, and the uh, beautiful integration of Amazon Instant Video. With that said, the Roku 3 is still my hands-down best pick for a media streaming device. It's $99 for the Roku 3 right now, and um, the content selection in the uh, channel store for the Roku 3 is phenomenal. You can get Netflix, Hulu, plus uh, Pandora, the basics. You've got HBO Go. You can even get Amazon Instant Video on there, which is something you really can't get on a lot of devices outside of the uh, Kindle Fire tablets and Amazon's own Fire TV streaming box. Um, you've also actually got the uh, YouTube application. Google just added the uh, Google Play Movies and TVs application. And every day, the content library and the channel store gets bigger and vaster and wider for the Roku platform. On the general UI that Roku updated, I think about a year ago now, is fantastic. Uh, every time you have a holiday, the uh, kind of interface with, with the Roku will change. So for uh, fall, we had kind of a leaf theme. For Christmas, it'll change kind of a Christmas theme in the background. Um, so it's kind of a very personal device. And you turn on your TV, it's very easy to navigate. You've just got kind of your uh, navigation on the side for movies and uh, TV shows, which is integrated with MGO, I believe, so you can kind of rent TV shows directly. Um, through the interface there. And then you've got your uh, right side where you can go through all your channels and select them. Um, just a general speed and performance of the Roku 3 is fantastic, like no complaints there. And you've got, uh, with the remote control, you can actually plug in a pair of uh, earbuds or headphones with a 3.5 millimeter headset jack. Um, so if you, maybe you got the Roku, you got it in a bedroom or something, uh, your spouse is trying to sleep and you want to watch uh, kind of a movie or TV show or listen to some music, just plug the earbuds into the remote and it actually uh, not cut it from playing through the speakers on your TV and just play it through your headphones. And I find myself using this feature a ton if I'm watching a YouTuber or something and uh, mom and dad in the mom and dad are in the bedroom right next to the living room so it's nice I have the TV cancel out while still watching stuff on the big screen downstairs. Um, so all in all it's just a really solid device and for 99 bucks you really can't go wrong. Um, it's been out for probably a year now I think if I'm getting my dates right. Um, but even between the Chromecast and the Fire TV and all the other media set-top boxes I've tried in the past, um, time and time again I find myself coming back to the Roku 3 just because between the content library and the overall performance and features it brings, um, just make it overall probably the best stream box or media player for me. Awesome. Well, looks like we've got a special guest here, so let's go ahead. and Tony, what's your pick uh, for this holiday season for uh, TV media devices? And also introduce us to a little uh, crib sheet there. Well, this this is Liam, and you can see he's got the uh, he's got the same hat on as I do, so he's he's nice and cozy in his little Tarzan blanket. I always whenever he's whenever he's naked and he's sitting in his blanket, I always just see Tarzan. So I'm probably gonna have to hand him back off to his wife because he's a little fussy now that I woke him up. But uh, my pick for the oh yep, come on, buddy, here you go. All right. <laughs> Okay, well now you've all gotten to meet Liam. Uh, my pick for the TV media device this year would still be the Chromecast, and here's why. Um, the Chromecast, uh, yeah, all the other stuff, the Roku, they're all great, and the next, even the Nexus Player, they're great uh, devices that if you want to buy something for yourself, if you want to buy something for a spouse, or if you have somebody else that you want to buy, you know, spend 100 bucks on, um, or maybe less if you're going for one of the streaming sticks. But the Chromecast is something that is so cheap. It's still so cheap. It's $35, and right now I think you can get it for $22. Um, it is such a good deal that you can actually buy one for pretty much anyone you need to buy a Christmas gift for. So I don't know, I've already bought two of them for different people this year uh, to give out as gifts because I like it so much. And it's, it's a little bit of a selfish thing because I'm building up my library on Google Play now. That's where I'm buying all my movies lately and TV shows. So now whenever I go over to someone's house that I care enough to have gotten this Christmas gift for, I can say, hey, you want to watch one of these movies I just bought? And I have my entire library in my pocket. So that, to me, that is so much value, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. No, yeah, I agree. And we were talking about this before the show. We've tried, uh, Ch Chuck and I were... We've tried a lot of smart TVs, and smart TVs are awesome. But I've tried LG, Samsung, and I think the Vizio one. Uh, but I still would prefer a Chromecast. It's just the the remote is my phone. I always have my phone. I don't need to futz around with a uh, you know finding another remote or finding another controller or anything like that or some weird dongle or anything like that. It's just plug it in and go. So I agree with you, Tony. Fred, what about you? What's your pick for uh, TV media devices? 
Well, I, I don't have too much comparison here. Um, the only one that I've used is a Chromecast. Um, it's beautiful, it's inexpensive, and as you said, you can control it from your phone, you can control it from your laptop, you can control it from your Chromebook, uh, those who want to go there again. Um, so I, I don't have too much more to add than, than that. No, so, no that's cool. Uh, Chuck, what about you? You got anything to add for uh, yeah. TV and media? I actually do. Uh, I'm going to piggyback off of Joe a little bit here, but I'm actually going to recommend the Roku Streaming Stick. Um, the Roku Streaming Stick is actually not a whole lot more expensive um, than the Chromecast, uh, but you get all the full features of the Roku. Um, so you basically get the best of both worlds. Um, it does support a lot of streaming from Android. Um, YouTube will stream to the Roku. Uh, Slingbox will stream to the Roku. You can uh, mirror your Android screen onto the TV through Roku. Um, in addition, you can actually put all the apps on the Roku stick itself, just like you would the Roku 3. Um, the only thing it lacks from the Roku 3 is it doesn't have that nifty little uh, plug headphones into the, um, the remote, which is kind of cool. I do kind of wish the streaming stick had that. Um, but the streaming stick is like a pack of gum. Uh, it's about the size of the Chromecast uh, and it has a little USB dongle that you plug into the TV. Um, I absolutely love it for all the same reasons Joe does. Um, I actually don't want to have to have a tablet or a phone to stream to the TV. I just want to click on the app and go. Um, and the Roku has Google Play, Amazon, Hulu, um, HBO Go, Blockbuster, MGo, uh, all the it's got ESPN, uh, uh, NHL Center Ice. Um, it's got a ton of sports programs. Plus, it's got all your channels. It's got um, you know uh, history, A and E, um, all, all those various channels. Now, most of those do require a cable subscription. Um, so I don't want to recommend this as a device where people think they can cut wires with cable. Um, most of the things you will find on the Roku do require you to have a cable subscription to sign in, uh, ESPN, uh, A&E, you know, those kind of things. Um, so it's not a device you can get and then cancel your cable bill. It's kind of a subsequent to your cable bill. Um, I have the Roku stick in my bar downstairs um, on that TV, and that TV does not have cable run to it, uh, and I've yet to find a reason to run cable to it with the Roku stick. Uh, so that's definitely my recommendation. Awesome. Very, very cool. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of options out there, and, I, and it, kind of like the rest of this stuff, it matters what you need out of it. If you need Amazon stuff, Chromecast may not be the way. If you need Google stuff like Tony does... Um, you know, a Fire Stick isn't the way. So, but a bunch of good stuff for for affordable, and really, you can get a a Fire Stick and a Chromecast and a Roku Stick for pretty much next to nothing, um, and you've got a full fledged smart TV and more, uh, plus games and all that kind of stuff too. All right, so let me talk about wearables. I have a huge recommendation for wearables. Um, I got my first Android Wear. Zen Watch, it's beautiful, it's fabulous, quick review, it's the best thing ever. No, but I do love it. I absolutely love it. Um, it's super thin. I'm trying to get that on the camera there for you. If you're watching or listening on the podcast later, um, just just look up Zen Watch and then go to my Google Plus because I've got this fantastic silver metal band that Tony got me for Christmas, and I have fallen more in love with this device. It had the leather band, which I liked a lot, but it was just a little tight. And now I've got this metal band, and it is like just super, superb and sharp. It's 200 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> for the value for what you get, it is a uh, round or squared kind of rounded corner. So it's not the round one like a 360 or GR. Um, but to me, it's perfect because Android Wear still is made for a square screen. So I absolutely love it. That's my pick for wearable. Um, and let's just jump around. Tony, I know you have an idea for your favorite wearable for holiday season. Yeah, and I've used... This is the only Android Wear that I've used, but I've used several other smartwatches, the Cogito Connected Watch, the Qualcomm Talk, the Martian uh, the Martian Notifier. So uh, some two of those really can, can be considered smartwatches, but the, that Qualcomm Talk definitely can. Um, and the Qualcomm Talk is really the closest non-Android Wear to an Android Wear because it had as a touch screen, but it had the Mirasol display similar to a Pebble, which lasted, and it lasted about a week or eight days. Um, so it had the battery life on Android Wear, but after owning the uh, Moto 360, man, this thing is fantastic. Um, people have been complaining about the battery life, and 
I haven't noticed it the first day. It wasn't great, but after since the first day, um, and when I'm not touching it, you know, it, every couple minutes, which the first day I was, I was sliding my finger around on it, just kind of messing around trying to see what it would do, and realized it doesn't do much when you don't have notifications. So I, I really only look at it when the, it buzzes. And um, I have gone to, every night I've gone to bed, I have at least um, 25 to 30% battery life left on it. And I'm not using uh, ambient display, but that's because it... It is actually less sensitive with ambient display on, and the the screen is not always on with ambient display on. So there's no to me there's no reason to use ambient display if it doesn't work as well. So when I look at my watch, when I turn my wrist to look at the watch, it automatically turns on. And that's really all I need. Um, it, or you know if it doesn't turn on, tap this display one time and it will pop up. So I've really been enjoying the Moto 360, and if you watch my Google Plus feed. Um, I actually got the leather band Moto 360 and purchased a Pebble Steel band for twenty dollars. So, for a total price of two hundred and seventy dollars, you could have a Moto 360 with a gorgeous. I don't know if you can see it, but a, a just a gorgeous um, metal band on it, and you actually saved thirty dollars from what they would charge you directly from Motorola to get the Moto 360 with the steel band, and you have two bands. Or you can buy the steel band direct from Motor Motorola for $80, which if you already had a leather band is going to put you another fit like $50 past what I, what, what, what I would have ended up paying for this with the metal strap. So highly recommend Moto 360. It's been awesome. It looks like a watch, and... Um, at least our photographer, when we were getting baby pictures done the other day, she didn't pay it any attention until she saw me tap it and swipe a notification away because I didn't want so and so is following you on Instagram in one of our pictures. And as soon as I, my wife, I wasn't paying attention, but my wife said, as soon as I swiped a notification away, her mouth dropped open like, "What did you just do?" Because <laughs> she didn't know it was a touch screen. She didn't know anything because it's you know it's just black and with a black band. And if you're not paying attention, it just looks like a watch. You don't think about it. You know how often do you look at other people's watches? Um, so that was pretty cool. And then to me, that is the now we've reached the point where wearables are what they're supposed to be. If nobody if if nobody looking at me can say why is he wearing that thing on his wrist, then I think we're at a point where wearables are really. It, um, at a mature enough point where people are going to start adopting them into their daily lives, non-tech people. <laughs> um, oh, but to follow that up, my budget pick for smartwatch this year. I know. Um, watch out for the G watch or the not the G watch R, the the LG G watch. The original one is two twenty nine MSRP. But if you watch the sales, uh, I know we picked one up for my dad for $99. And I know that they were selling them for $79 on, I think, the Play Store for Cyber Monday. So you're probably out for a $79 deal now. But keep watching because you'll probably see more deals as we see more uh, Android Wear announced. And as far as specs go, there's really not much variation from watch to watch. You're, it's really just about which, which form, form factor you prefer. So for, as far as getting someone broken into the Android, the smartwatch game or the Android Wear game, uh, grab them a, a budget, you know, or one that's on sale because I know my dad's really happy with his and we only paid 100 bucks for it. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, kind of add some input there for the watches. Um, the only other really Android Wear watch I've had personally myself has been the Samsung Gear Live, and that was a first-gen uh, Android Wear smartwatch. So that's not the watch I would recommend. Um, we're talking smartwatches in general. I absolutely love Android Wear. I think there's a lot of strong points with it, especially with the uh, Google Now voice dictation with the uh, navigation, turn-by-turn -turn directions on your wrist. That's just stuff from the future, and is uh, this kind of makes me like kind of smile and like do a little happy dance as a nerd when I can do that with my watch. Um, but for me personally, uh, one of the watches I owned earlier this year was the uh, Pebble Steel. Now the Pebble Steel came out, uh, I'm going to get my dates wrong, this past January I believe, and um, the watch itself is extremely beautiful. Now you can see right now I'm sharing on the screen, um, if you're listening to the podcast, uh, the Pebble Steel starts now for 199 which is about the starting price tag of the Zen Watch and the Samsung Gear Live. Um, but I had this watch for probably a good half of a year, and uh, the thing is just beautiful looking. You've got um, a very elegant construction here, up to seven days of battery life because you do have an e-ink display. 
Um, really nice charging configuration. No stupid cradles like you see on the uh, the Zen watch or especially the Gear Live because that's a nightmare of a way to charge your watch. Um, and it, we're not talking uh, as extensive of feature set that Android Wear has. Um, basically, you get your notifications on there. You can get some applications such as PayPal or ESPN and Foursquare, different things like that, and RunKeeper, uh, Weather Channel, Dots, uh, a lot of different watch faces. And this, for me personally, is probably a watch I would have a better time recommending to most people because Android Wear as itself as a platform is still very new. And the application selection for it and the applications that are compatible with Android Wear devices is growing at a very, very rapid pace. But for me, if I'm going to recommend someone a smartwatch today, uh, December 5th in 2014, honestly, I would probably have to lean more towards the Pebble Steel just because it's compatible with both Android and iOS, which is something you can't say for um, the Android Wear at this point in time. You've got up to a week of battery life, which is phenomenal, especially when you're talking about a max of... Uh, two days uh, at the very most with the Android Wear. And the application selection with the Pebble Store for the application on the Android and iOS is phenomenal. Uh, the selection of watch faces is really great. Uh, the application support of different apps you can load on the watch are really solid. And when you do buy the steel, you actually get a leather band and a metal band, which is actually the one Tony's using on his uh, Moto 360, is the, is the steel one that comes with the Pebble Steel or a metal one, actually. Um, so I absolutely still love this watch. If I, I'm honestly considering buying it again, just because if you put a fancy watch face on there, like an analog watch face, it looks like a normal watch, especially if you get the uh, coated black one. It looks gorgeous. The battery life is unprecedented. It's waterproof, and all in all, just for, kind of for a complete package, um, Pebble Steel is still probably one of the best smartwatches I can personally recommend, especially this holiday season for $199. Excellent. Yeah, I had a, a Pebble 2 back in the day, and I enjoyed it, especially for uh, multiple platforms and all that. And speaking of multiple platforms, uh, especially iOS, let's talk a little bit. We've talked a lot about devices and a lot about recommendations, uh, but let's talk about a, a jump to iOS. Fred, you are a hardcore Android enthusiast. We all know that, and most of our viewers and, and listeners are as well, but there is something to be said about iOS. So share a little bit about your transition from Android to iOS and your you're just weak in your experience with iOS in general. Well, um, I, I think Joe is really going to spearhead this one, and uh, I, I just want to say I, don't, I, I can't, don't know if we can really call it a transition to iOS. It wasn't a conversion. I don't think either of us have dumped uh, Android, but um, like Joe, I picked up a, uh, an iPad earlier this year. Um, mine has been a couple of months already. Joe is, I think, maybe a couple of weeks into his... Um, and it's uh, it, it's been a bit of a, a transition, um, just getting used to it. Although I have to say, for me, although I have some issues with the user interface, um, having been so accustomed to Android for so long, um, but um, it, it was not really a difficult transition in the way that it is trying to carry a Windows phone around with you, simply because I primarily live in. Google universe and um, happily all of the Google apps, um, at, at least everything that I live with, is readily available for iOS and in a, a very nice form for that matter. Yeah, like I got my um, iPad Air, like I said, about two or three weeks ago now, and this is actually the first iOS device I have ever used. Now I've played with my friends' iPhones or iPads here or there. That was maybe for five or ten minutes at a time. This is the first iOS and really big Apple product I have ever owned myself. And um, like Fred was saying, I'm not transitioning from Android. I've still got my OnePlus One here as my daily driver for my phone. And uh, hopefully the Moto X next week, crossing my fingers, Motorola gets that to me. But iOS in general is kind of a big difference coming from Android. Now, as all of you know, iOS is just a, a grid of applications and your icons right there. You can make folders and stuff, but that's about it. You know, no widgets on your home screen, nothing like that. And at first, when I was kind of unboxing the tablet and setting it up, I wasn't so sure how I was going to feel about it, but I primarily got this device or the iPad here for um, writing news articles because I do write for the Droid Goblin from time to time, and I use it a lot of the time for uh, notes during the show when we're doing this, and I found that having um, really no nothing to really customize the home screen with, no widgets to toy around with, um, I found myself being a lot more focused on what I'm working on. For example, um, when I do my writing on here, I use an application called Wordsmith, which is basically just a blank canvas, and you can go ahead and start typing your heart's content, whatever you want to type. 
And I'm not getting um, anything else to distract me from like I would on Android with different notifications and all that coming through and being able to easily open up another application or a mini application or even multitasking on Samsung devices with multi-window. Um, I found that the kind of limitation of iOS's ability to only run really one application at once, I actually found myself using that to my advantage, that kind of limitation, uh, some of you probably would call it, just because I found myself focusing on the task I was going to work on. If I wanted to be writing an article, I'd be writing the article. I couldn't really multitask and do something else. If I was uh, on Trello, which is what we use for kind of managing uh, mobile coverage from time to time, if I was on there working, I found myself, I was just looking at Trello, just using, um, looking ahead what we need to plan on for the channel for the coming weeks or so. And I, over time, I've really come to appreciate the simplicity of iOS. Now, I do prefer personally the uh, widgets and all the customization that you do get with Android. But the overall look of iOS is actually very beautiful, and um, you got to give Apple credit where credit is due. This thing has one gigabyte of RAM and I think a dual-core processor in here, which on Android would be ungodly for any device. But on here, I know that this isn't the best way to uh, demonstrate it, um, but it's still incredibly smooth. There's no lag whatsoever, and you really have to give Apple credit uh, and props for being able to make the overall experience run so smoothly and so flawlessly with such little processing speeds in there. Um, now, another thing that I found really, really fantastic is the battery life on this thing. I've been using the iPad Air um, since the duration of the show, and I'm still at 98% battery life. And that is with pretty much a screen being on the entire time. Now, if this was any Android tablet, I'd probably be down to about 90% or so. Um, and actually, my first week, my first couple weeks of using the tablet, um, actually this past week, I was able to get through an entire week's uh, worth of use with the device. Now, granted, some days, maybe he was only using the tablet for an hour here or there. Um, but for the most part, I was using it pretty consistently throughout all those days. And getting a full week out of a, a single charge for battery life on any tablet is phenomenal. Um, so Apple really knows how to um, utilize the batteries in their devices. Um, I haven't used an iPhone, so I can't comment on that. But the battery life I've been getting on here is far better than any Android tablet I've ever used. So really just for that fact right there, especially if you're traveling a lot, which is really what I got this for, to be able to have something to work on, that's still a very portable and thin and slight way I can take with me. Um, not having to worry about the battery life if it's 100% or even 50% is really having that peace of mind uh, makes for a very great experience, especially if you're talking about uh, kind of a device that's going to be um, maybe like a portable computing station or even something that's going to replace a laptop for you. So uh, how's your battery life been with it, Fred? In the uh, battery kind of life has, has been tremendous. Is, is yours, are, are you on a cellular network or are you Wi-Fi only? I am a Wi-Fi only with this thing. Yeah, same here. Now, again, if you're if we were on a cell network, um, it might be consuming a lot more battery trying to stay connected in fairness. But um, even idle time is tremendous. Um, I, I will put the iPad down, leave it partly charged, and uh, and sometimes come back days later. It's not a daily driver for me. I do use it, but um, I've left it for a week and come back with 75% power, um, which would never happen on any kind of an Android device. Um, so Apple certainly knows what they're doing as far as battery optimization and memory optimization as well, um, which I found in the past with... Um, with um, my uh, my um, now outdated, but but uh, my my MacBook Pro, which was oh probably about eight years old, it was a first generation Intel chip MacBook Pro, um, and um, it it's certainly outdated now. I, I maxed it out at two gigabytes of RAM, which which simply doesn't cut it for modern versions of of iOS. But for the first two or three OS updates. Um, it just kept getting better each time that I updated. Um, now, again, that's not iOS, but it's still, it's, it's Apple, and they, they know what they're doing, and, and their upgrades do tend to optimize things better as opposed to what I got used to with Windows, which is simply um, every time you need to upgrade the OS, you need to upgrade the specs or at least the uh, the, the RAM and, and, and CPU on, on your machine. Um, but yeah, battery life, no problem. Um, how how are you finding? Well, you mentioned you mentioned desktop. Um, I, I will say that the desktop or home screen on um, on a tablet I don't find to be as crucial as it is on a phone. 
Um, phone, you want to be able to whip it out of your pocket, glance at it, leave it on your desk, see what's going on, access everything from one place, whereas, as you said, on your tablet, you're probably working in one particular space. Um, unlike you, I did, um, well, I set everything up. When, when I first got it, the first things I installed were Gmail, Hangouts, and so on, and let uh, at least when I'm at home and I'm on a network, um, I just let it uh, rip as far as notifications. So I do get drowned out with notifications. Um, because of the way I'm using it, I don't mind the desktop home screen as much, but I, I, I am surprised. And I, this is not my first iOS device. I had a second generation uh, iPod Touch and the really lack of evolution of the home screen is something that really surprises me on this one. It just it seems to be completely mindless that yeah you can do folders, you can you can put some things on your desktop but uh, there's no way to really turn it into anything but just sort of a, a catch basin for the the icons of everything you you install. You can move them around a little and clean it up but uh, that's about all you can do. Um, how do you find navigating around, just working within your apps on the iPad compared to Android, say? Um, it definitely has taken me some time because especially in more recent versions of Android, we kind of have the hamburger side menu where you kind of swipe over um, from the side of the screen to get more uh, settings and stuff. I find myself doing that an awful lot of the time um, and not having anything happen um, with what I was trying to get to. So just navigating, coming from a separate operating system that you that I've used for so long since the days of 2.1 Eclair on the Samsung Galaxy S Fascinate on Verizon, it's definitely a bit of a learning curve for maybe that first half an hour or so. I'm just kind of learning how all the applications are laid out, how to navigate through each of them. Now most of them, like Facebook, Twitter, um, Google+, different things like that, YouTube, it's pretty easy to figure out how to navigate different things. Um, but there are a couple of little caveats here and there with just different things that are native to Android that I've just kind of become used to that aren't present here in iOS. Um, commenting, though, on what kind of Fred was saying with the home screen, there is no way I would be able to deal with having this interface on my phone. Um, because if I'm taking my phone out, like on my OnePlus One right here, I have got a, a widget there for the uh, current weather conditions, the time, any upcoming calendar appointments, and then I have a uh, calendar widget here to see my upcoming events. And like you were saying, Fred, uh, your phone, you kind of whip it out of your pocket, glance your notifications, you're good to go. Um, I would never own an iPhone for that matter because I need to have more information right at a glance on it. But I think it actually works really nice for a tablet. Now, widgets, I always like them, but I really did find myself preferring having just kind of a very clean interface and kind of a slate of the different things I want to do. I've made different folders. I made a Google folder on here. I've made kind of a uh, productivity folder. I made a folder for the different Apple pre-installed applications on here. So for a phone, I would definitely not be a fan of this. But for a tablet sake, for what I want to do, I just want to kind of get in there, get some stuff done. I actually kind of have to say that I do prefer how this is laid out. And uh, another thing like we kind of talked about earlier, the application selection on here and the application optimization for that larger display is phenomenal because one of the uh, biggest strengths and weaknesses of Android is that it is open source, meaning that anyone can take Android, put it on a device, get Google's authorization, get the Play Store on there, and be good to go. And I know there's a lot more uh, technical details involved with that whole process, but essentially you can put Android on a phone if you're a big enough company and get it out there to the market. And while that's fantastic to have different choice in the market, it also means there's a lot of varying screen sizes out there. So you've got tablets with a 7-inch display, 8-inch uh, displays, 8.4-inch displays, 10-inch displays, 12.2-inch displays. So you've got to optimize all those applications or optimize those applications for those screen sizes for those certain devices, which causes for a lot of fragmentation for, throughout um, Android as a whole, meaning if you've got maybe a 12.2-inch tablet, you're probably going to be running in most cases, and you've got a good chance of running just a blown up version of an application for a smartphone with maybe a 5 inch display. Now what's nice about one of the pros of Apple being kind of closed source with iOS is that they're only making um, applications for tablets with a 9.7 inch display here with the iPad and with the 7.9 inch display with the iPad mini. And Apple controls what has iOS running on it because they're the only company that's going to manufacture devices with iOS, meaning that the applications you do get run beautifully. The selection is phenomenal. There's a pretty much any application you want is optimized for the tablet, meaning you've got multiple columns of content to look at. Um, so really, the applications do take advantage of 
the display, whereas maybe the home screen doesn't. So maybe, kind of in a perfect world, I'd like to have maybe the Android home screen that's taking advantage of a larger canvas by having the iOS side of things where the applications are taking advantage of the canvas. So there's definitely pros and cons um, to how Apple handles it and to how Android handles it. But for the most part, I would much rather have all my applications take advantage and take the optimization for those larger displays uh, since that's pretty much what I'm going to be using most of the time on the tablet. Now, Joe, uh, just jump in here real quick. One, I will agree with you on the widgets on uh, the the uh, Android versus iOS, but one thing I do like about it, if you turn that tablet on and you swipe down, um, I do love that display right there. I wish Android had that. Um, I found myself using that a lot um, on the tablet itself, uh, which for me, I have the widgets for my calendar um, and kind of the upcoming stuff in the weather. So that's one thing um, I do actually kind of wish Android would bring over to iOS uh, I do like that a lot. Yeah, I haven't uh, toyed around too much with like, the widgets, the widgets in there, but I do have to agree with you. Just being able to swipe down, and, like it's telling me, currently cloudy, 32 degrees, high today in the forecast was 39, and then calendar events if I did have any. Um, I think that was new in iOS 7 or iOS 8, um, but it is a really nice feature, being able to swipe down through any application, and so kind of have a, uh, a general way to... Um, view kind of sort of widgets in your notification panel. So it's Apple's definitely, they're kind of making their way into um, widgets per se with the uh, notifications. Um, would like to see a bit more support for that area of things, but this is definitely something they are working on and is a nice feature to have on here. So a, a couple more, I know we're kind of we're going over on time here, but a couple more little comments on iOS UI. Um, one really nice feature, which I think has been on iOS from the very beginning, and I wish would have made it somehow into Android, is the ability to, wherever you are navigating in a document, in a browser window, in an email window, or wherever it is, um, it's it's fairly universal in almost any iOS app that you can you can get back the equivalent of, of doing home or control home on a on a PC keyboard by tapping the uh, the uh, top. Uh, header bar, uh, whatever you'd call that top bar at the top of the screen, um, a double tap will, will bring you back to the top of the doc document. And there is no um, universal way to get that home navigation on Android. And um, quite frankly, I don't know why they don't implement something like that. As far as personal annoyance, um, I, I still don't understand the idea of using one single button, um, whether it's a physical button or not, um, to try to navigate through everything. In the absence of the context menus and the absence of a, a universal back button on iOS um, makes it, to me, um, not the, uh, the the smooth, seamless experience that everybody says it's supposed to be. It's still I still find it clumsy and... Uh, and, and just kind of a nuisance to maneuver through. But uh, again, if I if I live there in, in that space, um, I might get used to it. Well, I think what we found is there's a, a lot of good options, even in iOS. Good chat, fellas. I, I appreciate that. I know it kind of was a little different than uh, the rest of our show, but it was good for a lot of us that just kind of need to know a little bit, especially if we're looking at a good tablet like we've recommended going to iOS. So it's a good thing that we do. Stuff like that. Um, but that just about wraps up our show. I know we went a little long, so it's uh, about a 90-minute show tonight, but it was something that we needed to get to you guys, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Uh, but be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Our goal is to hit 3,000 uh, subscribers by Christmas. And uh, so we've got a few weeks to do that. We just crossed over 2,200, so we're excited about that. But let us know in the comments down below or hit us up on the MCOJ Brew hashtag if you're listening on the podcast. What are you planning to pick up this holiday season? What are you excited about? What would you recommend? Were we right? Were we wrong? Uh, let's talk about it. Uh, but, yeah, hit us up in the comments or on the hashtag and let us know what you think. But that's our thoughts. Those are our picks for holiday season 2014. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to click subscribe. We'll see you guys next week. Good night. Good night. See you guys.